Hi, you're listening to or watching the Randy Alvarez podcast. Today on the program, it, it's a hot topic. In fact, out of all the topics I've done over the last 24 years of interviewing doctor, medical doctors and dentists and specialists, uh, this is my favorite topic because it's one of those things that everybody could benefit from. And it's, it's almost like an inside scoop. It's an insider thing. And that's why we say this is kind of a behind the scenes in medicine show of things that most people don't know about that actually work. And so I wanted to title it, it's how to never lose your teeth, how to never have tooth loss and for sure never end up in dentures. And that's a bit of an overstatement, but I have literally like a, 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 a world-class guy that's known, uh, he's, a, he's a key thought leader in dentistry and periodontics. Uh, we've had him on my television show before and, uh, with us, we have Dr. Stephen Brown. Dr. Brown, thanks for coming on the program. It's a pleasure as usual to be with you, Randy, anytime. Now, I told some of my team here, and they said that's the world's most boring talk topic, talking about bleeding gums, bad breath, loose teeth. But this is one of those things that you can treat. And so let's start off the bat that, that how many denture wares, Dr. Brown, are there out there, you think? Millions. Like, 30 million people, because I Googled it, like 30, 40 million people, upper lower denture. Easily. Easily. And these people all lost their teeth. And the majority of those people, would you say, had the gum disease or this bacterial infection in the mouth had something to do with their tooth loss? Absolutely. And the, the truth is that the trip downhill to losing your teeth can be long, tedious, painful, and uncomfortable because this doesn't happen all at once. It usually happens over time. And for a variety of reasons, most people don't know what they can do or what's available today or the progress that we've made with people being able to save their teeth. Now, since it's a bacterial infection, you're using an FDA approved laser technology to kill all the bad bugs in the, in the mouth and spare the good bacteria. Is that, Correct. And we're going to get into that in a little yeah. while. I want to tease people with that. But but I first want to talk a little bit about your bio because they, they need to know that they're listening to literally a world expert on this topic. So let's start with uh, a little bit about your bio, because I know you, I think, head up a couple of uh, university programs. So why don't tell me a little bit about yourself. I did. Um, so ever since I completed my graduate studies uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, well, I went to dental school at Temple. And I did my post, I was in the service for a couple of years in which I practiced dentistry, honing my skills a little bit. And then I went back to the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the very early 70s, which at the time was literally the center of the universe for periodontal. I, I felt that I'd been knighted when I was selected <laughs> okay. for the program. And there were only a handful of us. And in those days, we were treating periodontal disease uh, with a traditional method, which was surgery for the most part. And as I got into my own practice, I started to see patients who I treated, I thought I treated them amazingly well with conventional surgical procedures to eliminate pockets, which was what the periodontics was all about back then. I would see these and same by the people way, come. For working definition of this, these pockets. So when you have this bacterial infection, the gums tend to move away a little bit from the teeth, and the bone That's underneath, exactly right. and the bone underneath starts to get eaten away by the bacterial infection, and then the the tooth starts to get loose, and then you in eventually lose it. In, simpli in simplistic terms, that's exactly what happens. And the key here is, we used to treat the pockets rather than the bacteria or the disease. By the way, disease. the pockets, again, that's the space of the gums pulling away from the teeth? Yes. Okay. Yes, in effect. It's the effects of the disease, not the cause of the disease. Okay. And that's the major breakthrough. That's what caused the uh, me to start thinking in a completely different way than I did before. And what we found was the, the whole idea, the whole theory behind doing periodontal surgery was, well, the bacteria, everybody admits that there are bacteria that cause this problem. The bacteria cause these pockets, which you referred to, and there's a, a nibbling away at the bone, if you will, and the pockets get deeper. And the 
theory behind it was if you eliminate the pockets, then you're going to be able to better able to clean the teeth. And that makes sense, I guess, on the surface. But in, in practice, it's not, it doesn't work. And here's the reason why. You do surgery, which is painful. And what are you doing uh, with the surgery, by the way? That's the part I'm not getting. Well, that part of the gum that you described that's, uh, that's separated from the tooth, that pocket, if you take that away, there's no longer a pocket. Theoretically, the patient can clean their teeth better. But what they now have is long, first of all, they've had pain from surgery. Second of all, they have long, sensitive roots. Thirdly, there are spaces between the teeth now. So if anything, it makes it more difficult. You know, I, by the way, we, we've talked about this before, uh, Dr. Brown, that, and I really, it didn't sink in until right now. So you're actually cutting off the top of the gums surrounding the tooth, which is the so-called infected area to just get rid of the bacterial infection. Is that it? They're, we're cutting it away to get rid of the results of the bacterial infection. Okay. And that's the big breakthrough. That's the difference. We never paid any attention to literally treating the bacterial infection because if you can successfully treat the bacterial infection, you don't have to do resective, invasive, painful, traditional surgery. And this is how it's been done across the country for the most part, like 80, 90% of all, all bacterial infections in the mouth are being treated by cutting it out. Is that true? Is it 80% or more maybe? No, I don't think it's fa fair to say that, but most periodontal disease that results in pockets is being treated with surgical procedures to eliminate those pockets. Well, I think that's a then fair Then that is 80% or so. That may be. For, I'm talking about advanced be. cases. We're not talking about basic tooth decay. I'm talking about for advanced yeah. cases. Yes, absolutely. And the problem, once again, is they pay, they're they treating the effects and not the cause. Interesting. And what changed my point of view and my direction and my vision was the idea that, you know what, we ought to be treating the cause and not the effects. And that came home to me because patients who'd been treated very effectively in my office would come back three to five years later needing to have the surgical procedures done again. And I started to say, there must be a better way. And that's when I started to look to other um, modalities of treatment. And you found a laser that kills the bad bugs, this bacteria. That's simplifying well, it. it. It was, it was a long trip, but yes, I was exposed to um, a certain type of laser that is able to identify, in effect, identify the bacteria. Let me explain. Laser light energy is attracted to colors. And the bacteria that are known to cause periodontal disease, if one was to grow them in a, uh, in a microbiology lab, would have colonies of red, yellow, orange, and black. So the laser light energy is attracted to those colors, kills the bacteria on contact without any, um, any damage to collateral tissues. So that in itself was really exciting. If you know about lasers, you know that they use lasers to take tattoos off. The reason they can, are effective in taking tattoos off is they're attracted to colors. Okay. And the color, and they eliminate the colors, and you get rid of all a part of the tattoo. Works kind of the same way. You know the the you know the dermatologist. We have a lot of. I have a buddy that's a dermatologist, but you know they're they're heating the the skin, and then the body regenerates, force it lays down new collagen, and rebuilds. And then they have lasers for brown spots, red spots, things like that. Is it the same kind of thing in the mouth? No, um, th those types of lasers. As you said, they create heat. We don't want to create any heat. These lasers are pulsed lasers. And the pulsed laser, it's an, it's an ND YAG laser, one of the most common lasers used in medicine. And it works on pulses. The more rapid the pulses, the more powerful the hit to the bacteria. And the laser that I'm using, and there are others like it, the laser that I am using is in millionths of a second. So in millionths of a second, it's pulsing, getting through the tissue, the diseased tissue, and getting at the bacteria. If 
you kill the bacteria, now you reverse the process and allow the tissue to regenerate without cutting it away. So you do get a regeneration like they do in cosmetic surgery with lasers or radiofrequency or these other things. Yes, you're getting regeneration of the soft tissue, and often you're getting regeneration of the hard tissue, the bone that supports the tooth, some of which has been lost. Now, that's not totally predictable, and it doesn't happen all the time, but here's the most important part. If you kill the bacteria, and you stop the disease, and you give the patient an easy way to kill bacteria on a daily basis, then they can resist recurrence of the disease forever. The key here is what we can teach the patient about how to kill bacteria instead of moving them around with toothbrush and floss. Now you, you teach this, uh, or you teach uh, at what, two universities? Yeah. I'm professor of periodontics at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm professor of periodontics at Temple University. This is in the postgraduate division where we teach the residents. And I'm director of the Dental Implant Center at Albert Einstein. So I have 12 residents at Temple, about 25 at Penn, and 10 newbies just out of dental school learning to do dental implants at Albert Einstein Medical Center. So yes, I spend a fair amount of my time in teaching. Now I talked to you about this laser, I don't know, six, seven years ago or whatever. And you had a dirty little secret back then. That means here you are in your own private practice using the laser every day to help patients, but yet you couldn't teach it to the students that were going to be peri future periodontists. Is that true? And what about today? That is absolutely true. And it was for two reasons. One reason was the laser was not that broadly accepted. I mean, I, I literally stuck my head out of the foxhole when I started using this because I was the first person within probably 50 or 100 miles of Philadelphia to have that laser. And that was more than 10 years ago. At the time, nobody was using lasers. So, uh, and you, you weren't able to teach it for that reason. And you didn't have the opportunity to teach it to others for that reason. And there was some reason for that with the company that made the laser. Actually, they wanted people to have a really good training. So indicated for me, it took me one full year of training until I was fully released to be able to do this routinely for patients. So they were very, very uh, you know, that, circumscribed. Yeah, you know, that's interesting because look, you got a busy pro and this is in medicine too, that there, you know, whether it's, and I'm learning this from the thoracic surgeons, that there's new technology, but they literally have to, almost quit their job or they got to be willing to spend a hundred thousand plus dollars plus the cost of leaving their practice, fly somewhere, learn this technique. Like you said, it took you a year all to not make any more money. That means it's not like you're making more money from it. In fact, it's more tedious, but it's, but if you really care about your patients, right, you want to give them the best you can do. So it's really just a small group of people that really want to be at the cutting edge of helping people and that there's a better way, like you said earlier. Um, but you know, literally whatever you do, you don't want to do any harm and you want to do this the right way. And it, the fact that this is a new technology does not mean in any sense or form that I'm some sort of a cowboy, because I never wanted to be that. I wanted to be able to give my patients the best and most advanced treatment that was available. That's what my teachers taught me. Now, the periodontist being the gum specialist, the, bone, the, 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 the people that you know understand that part of it and dental implants and things like that, um, are, uh, across, because look, you know, I was at a meeting of yours at the North. You, you're one of the founding members of the North American Society of Periodontics. I was there talking about uh, using television to get your word out. And I asked people in the audience when I could have been eight, nine years ago, I said, how many of you are using the laser? And, and since their whole life revolves around killing the bad bugs, how many of you are you using laser? And there might've been three people. And then at the break out of a hundred, and at the break, why not? They go, well, the science isn't there. The science isn't there. The data's not there. We're not going to experiment on our patients. There was like three guys in the room. So I went there again, and now almost everybody is using the laser. And But but that's not typical. That means that North American side of periodontics is kind of a unique group. But across the country, would you say less than 10% or about 10, 15% of all periodontists are using this laser? Do you have any numbers on no, that? I 
I, I think today there's a higher number than 10%. But back then- 20, 20, 20 30? Yeah, I think that's probably fair to say. Well, uh, 20 to 30%. So seven it's out of- still a very, I mean, seven out of 10 periodontists, unknowingly, the patient's going to get rid of this bacterial infection with the bad breath, the bleeding gums, the loose teeth. And if you go to the wrong guy, the seven out of 10, you're going to get it. They're going to try to attempt to cut out this infection, which is kind of ridiculous, as you've told me in the past. Well, the, the I'm paraphrasing the matter, you, of course, but. Yeah. Uh, you know, let me go back a step okay. or two with this, because. First of all, we had to determine that there was a bacterial infection that we could see. Okay. And going way back to the 60s, and uh, I'm dredging up some old information, Paul Kies, who was um, a, a researcher at NIH and also a dentist, discovered that you could see these bacteria. So one of the things that's really great to be able to do is if a new patient comes into my office, I have a phase contrast microscope. It's a, not a fancy microscope. And I tell the patient, I sit down with them. They're there for periodontal therapy. Mrs. Jones, periodontal disease is an infection. It's caused by bacteria. We can identify those bacteria. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is take a little sample of material from around your gum line. Doesn't hurt. And we're going to look at it together under a like phase is it swab, like like a swab of some sort. I, I literally take a little curette or probe, go around the gum line, and I can always. You only need a tiny bit. You put it on a slide, just like any microbiology. You take it to some to a uh, microscope which has a big TV camera associated with it, and instantaneously the patients can see what's causing the disease. And here's the good part. They look at that screen and they say, you mean those things are in my mouth? <laughs> and, and, and instantaneously, they've got the message and it's their, their mother, when they were growing up, said they didn't want germs. So they want to get rid of it. What do I need to do to get rid of this? And it's a really terrific way. And we tell them, you don't have to believe us. As we're doing the treatment and as you're going through learning some of the ways to prevent this in your mouth, we're going to continually take slides and look at the bacteria and you will see them disappearing. You know, so we know that it works. You know, I, I, I had a, a, a periodontist in my office, brought a microscope, did the whole bit. Uh, and we, sh he showed me a video like you're describing and I'm seeing these things swimming around. One of them was a spiral key. I don't remember what they do, but they're really bad. They could get into your brain and all this other stuff. And then he showed me an after, after a little bit of treatment, actually some home care stuff that you taught me. And all of a sudden that same slide, they're all floating around like they're dead. They're just, I mean, exactly right. right before your eyes, you could see a before and after. Are you you're doing what, that, right? Yes, that's what the laser does. The laser kills the bacteria. And then, and you, you need to understand this as well. It's not, and I tell this to my patients. Just using the laser is not going to solve periodontal disease. It's not a magic pill. The fact of the matter is that if I gave you a high dose of antibiotics, it would kill the bacteria as well. Unless there's some follow-up treatment in which the hygienist or the dentist can give strategies to the patient that they can do at home easily in a friendly manner, that they can kill the bacteria on a daily basis because that's what it requires long term. And as you said before, those same bacteria have been indicted for a whole bunch of other diseases, life threatening diseases, up to and including heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. You know, I, great point. You know, I, I had somebody in here yesterday that I'm interviewing from the Breen Center for Optimal Health, like one of the biggest heart centers, at least in, in California. Um, in Orange County, California. And you, listen to this, this might be good news for you. So on there, they call it the dirty dozen to prevent heart disease, reverse heart disease and stroke is get rid of gum disease. You've got to find a doctor and guess what? He's preaching the laser that you're talking about. This is how, so mainstream medicine and not so mainstream medicine, th this is what they explained so well to me. And, and you have to tell me if you agree with this. They said, ready, in light of COVID, Right. 
everybody wants a strong immune system right now. If you have a bacterial infection in your mouth, on your arm or wherever, it's going to take some of the energy away from your immune system. And so if you, if you get rid of that infection, now your body is more likely to help you fight COVID or fight diabetes or fight whatever else. Absolutely. And, and, and let me tell you what it is that we do with the patients so that they can control their own disease and will work exactly as that physician said to you. We typically use, uh, we put them on an, an ultrasonic um, uh, toothbrush. You hold, know, hold on a second. Their- I'm going to force people to listen to this podcast a little longer. We're going to get to the little secret sauce that you taught me. And if okay. anybody could see my teeth, I don't have to brush and floss all the time. My teeth, I feel like nothing could, bad could grow in my mouth because of what he's going to share with you in a minute. I want to ask you about your life. How does a guy become a periodontist? And when did you know? It, it seems it, it like was, such an was, odd thing to me. It, it, was a, it was a long trip. I was a, a very average student in high school. Uh, I went to Case Western Reserve University because in those days, if you went away, in other words, to the Midwest for this New Yorker, you could get into a much better school. Case Western Reserve University, I was an English literature major. You want to know how I got into dental school? This is kind of strange. But the, the reality was I learned to think. And that was one of the things that was a gift to me. The people that taught me from that school made me look at things from three sides all the time. In any case, um, I was able to get accepted into dental school at Temple after three years. So I never actually got a degree from college. I was in such a rush to get into what what my profession was going to be that I went to dental school after three years. Did you, by the way, did you even then think you were going to be a regular dentist, like doing cavities and partials and bridges. That's, that's what I anticipated okay. that I would be doing. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and it's an interesting question because what I found in dental school was I didn't like the mechanical stuff, the, 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 the cutting, the, the, the fillings, the crowns and all that sort of stuff, dentures. And I, I never really enjoyed any of that. And what I liked was the biologic aspect and the thought processes that went into periodontics. So out of the dental school at Temple, I was accepted. uh, I went in the Navy for two years. And when I was in the Navy, I had an opportunity to do most everything. And there were at the time a couple of programs around the country that were super terrific for periodontics. And I had a mentor when I was in the Navy who showed me what was possible. And I was doing periodontics in the Navy one chapter ahead of whatever it was I was doing for my, for my Navy patients. I was fortunate enough to be accepted to the University of Pennsylvania School uh, of Dental Medicine and their postgraduate periodontal program was world famous in the early 70s. Is this kind of, okay, so the periodontists are the people that save teeth, right? So you, rather than just doing a bunch of patchwork, a filling here, a bridge there, and you wanted to get to the bottom of that you could, po- I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but that you're thinking, I, I could probably save a lot of people's teeth if, if I really understand this bacterial infection that's wiping out everybody's teeth, because that's what keeps dentists in business. I, I, exactly, and you know, I, I like to think of the periodontists as being a little bit more global thinkers. And those people tend to look left, right, and center in an attempt to find out which things work. And, but I have to tell you, I was trained traditionally when I was at Penn. I mean, we wanted to be exquisite surgeons. And what happened is I went into practice And I was doing what I considered to be outstanding surgery in the conventional or traditional way. And I would see patients. By the way, define the surgery. You're talking about cutting the gums to get rid of this infection. To get rid of the pockets. Okay. I wasn't even thinking about infection at that time. To get rid of the pockets so they could clean their teeth better and the infection would go away. Wow. So. That was what we were doing back then. But I would see patients of mine coming back after one to five years needing to have treatment again. 
So we needed to find a better way, a different way. And um, one of the things uh, that we started doing was looking at why these patients were having such a difficult time. And we wanted to make life a little bit easier for them. So one of the things that I latched onto was the use of the water irrigating device, a water pick. It, I don't know whether I'm supposed to use particular terms, but there are many of them on the market. And the key is that the water irrigating device cleans between teeth, which theoretically is where one cleans when they're using dental floss. So and underneath the gum a, line, underneath a little bit, a little bit underneath the gum line. A little bit, a little bit. But if you use a water irrigating device and you add to the water an antimicrobial agent, and there are several that I could talk about, um, then you are delivering something that's going to kill those bacteria. And there was a guy by the name of Mike Newman, who I believe is out in California right now. He was head of the Harvard program of periodontics. And he showed that a water irrigating device could go down six to seven millimeters inside one of these pockets. Now, if you could get down five or six millimeters and bring with the water something that kills the bacteria, we win the ball game. We absolutely win the ball game. So, and there are a number of things you can use. The one that I, is, is easiest to use is a couple of drops, a quarter teaspoon of ordinary household bleach. And I say that- Bleach, oh my with, God. I was gonna say that with, with President Trump in mind, I'm a little worried. But when patients screw up their face, they say, what? I say, did you ever go swimming in a swimming pool? What did you smell? Chlorinated water, it's in all of our drinking water. Chlorinated water kills bacteria. So I'm not saying you can. Yeah, and take by the way, your Trump reference was because he said, hey, he looked over to the person at the news and says, well, why can't we ingest some of these things to kill the bad bugs? But they yeah, also kill the good bugs. So you have to be careful. But you put he, a little bit of this in your water pick and it goes under the gum line and it kills the bad bugs. Is that right. what's going on? That's exactly right. And there are other things you can put in there as well. That happens to be a very, very, everybody's got it in the house. And I'm talking about a couple of drops in a chamber of water. That's all it requires. By the way, you told me this. I, I forgot where we were. I was at one of your meetings. And when you told me that, I thought it was kind of crazy. Well, at that time, I was told I had some pockets, like four millimeter pockets at my, uh, my dentist. But then I thought I'm going to self-treat. And I used a couple of other, your little secret sauce protocols that you're going to share a little later. But I go back in two millimeter pockets and they don't believe me that I did it on my own. And I told them what I did. And the hygienist looked at me like I was literally out of my mind. The dentist laughed at me, Chris Henninger. I'll mention his name. He goes, Randy, I never, look, I'm a dent. I never heard of such a thing. Exactly. And this is like very common. All you got to do is make the swimming pool reference and they get it. They put it in through with, with gas, but it's still the same thing. It's chlorinated water. It's in all our water supplies around the country and the world. It's common. At a certain level, it kills the bacteria. And to use it in the mouth, we're talking about, think about our chamber of water about that size and a couple of drops of ordinary household bleach or other. How often there do you recommend, other, the way, is that only for advanced problem? Like when my... When mine went away, meaning my pockets, you know, my gums grabbed back onto my teeth, that that I just dabbled in a little bit of salt. I dabbled in a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, which doesn't kill the good bugs as much or at all in some cases. Uh, That's that was Paul Kaiser's technique, and he well, you he, taught me he, that technique. He was attacked right, left, and center, but using using the water pick method is much easier for the average patient. He had people brushing with baking soda, um, you know, and, and um, salt. And it was, it was more difficult to do, but he had the right idea. He was the one who was paying attention to the bacterial infestation. So back then, even they were so, thinking so, so it blows my mind. Even today, smart periodontists, the gum guys, instead of going, well, this is an infection. No, we're just going to cut out the infected areas and then rinse it, give them a rinse, give them some antibiotics and see what happens. But still, because it's microscopic, 
it's all the stuff they're leaving behind that ends up taking over again. And it's just a vicious cycle. Is that true? And it is not only true, but they are more prone to get it back again because, as I said before, they have these long, sensitive roots because the roots are exposed to the oral environment. They've got spaces between their teeth that are more difficult to clean. So we want to give them something that's going to be easy, and we don't want to cut the gum away if we don't have to. So if we're able to reverse the infection, healing occurs, reattachment occurs, now, teeth tighten. You know, I'm one of these curious people on certain things, and, and I don't want to dominate this conversation, but I will tell you, I don't know if you remember the story. So the first time I went to the dentist was when I was 18 because I got hit in the mouth uh, playing mm -hmm. basketball. And my teeth were blistering white. And the guy goes, you really take care of your teeth. And I probably brushed every other day because my teeth were every day. It's like, your teeth are so white. So why even brush them, right? And then the second time I went to the dentist, when I was 40 years old, second time, because my lower teeth had shifted and I wanted to get four veneers, instant orthodontics. Don Brown said, when well, normally we'd schedule for your cleaning, but you've obviously had a cleaning. And I said, I haven't been to the dentist since I was 18 years old. And I've never flossed before in my life, except for a couple of times that I get something stuck in there. So my teeth were blistering white, like ridiculously white, no whitening trays. Th did you ever, did I ever tell you this story? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, it all has to do with periodontal disease. So then um, I'm getting my, my, and then anyway, and then, so I never had a problem. I started dating this famous nutritionist. I don't want to mention her name. She's got three best-selling books. She sees that I'm salting my food too much and eating sunflower seeds. And she goes, no more salt for you. With, and both my parents were dentures. Within seven months, my breath was so bad. I mean, it was, I was getting gum disease and I didn't realize it because the salt was keeping this, killing these bad bugs. In my case, it was what I heard later. And they got yellow and then I got back on the salt and back on, you know, and I met you guys and that's where I kind of turned it around. But I wanted to be in the Guinness Book of World Records as a kid for something. And I had eight or 30 bags of sunflower seed shells and I wanted to be the guy that ate more sunflower seeds than anybody in the world. So at all times, my cheeks are puffed up. And I mean, it was all the time. If I'm not with my girlfriend, I'm eating sunflower seeds. And so this guy tells me, he goes, you know, Randy, this is the guy swabbing my mouth to look at the bad bugs. He goes, it's funny you tell me that story because one of the things that kills this bacterial infection is salt. It literally explodes it on contact. And so, of course, I stopped eating sunflower seeds like that. So now I'm like everybody else. And then my teeth slowly got discolored. But once I took your protocol with the water pick, I'm back. And if you look at my teeth, I mean, they're pretty white. I'm not doing anything to them. And my secret goal is I don't ever want to have to go to the dentist again. I don't know if that's a crazy goal, but... There's another thing that, that we should talk about along those very lines of what you're saying. And that is most people don't understand that these same bacteria that cause periodontal disease cause bad breath. These bacteria produce um, gases and those gases are what causes your breath to have, you know, breath malodor. And the bacteria colonize the posterior portion of your tongue. So if you were to look at your tongue under a microscope, it would look like your front lawn, like a lot of grass. And the bacteria can easily get down in there and you can't get at them and you don't know to get at them. A tongue scraper will help, but a, an antiseptic solution is even better. These bacteria produce something called VSCs, volatile sulfur compounds. And that's what causes bad breath. So people can use breath mints. They can use- I lived on those uh, things. Yeah. And they'll work for about five minutes. <laughs> right. but, if you, but if you get rid of the bacteria, and these are the same bacteria that cause periodontal disease. So if you're using a tongue scrape, let's say, or a toothbrush on the back of your tongue, and you're using a water irrigating device that's delivering an antimicrobial agent, you're not only killing periodontal disease, you're killing the bugs that cause bad breath. And that in itself is a benefit. And, you know, 22 years ago, I did a, you know, we, I scared you, we emailed you. I said, I want to do a show like the flossing could kill you. 
And, and it was like, I'm not going to throw my 40 year reputation away just for you, Randy, on a podcast. I go, no, 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 I was kidding around because I did a show with a, with a really a way out there dentist. And he said, Randy, if you break that mucosal barrier, if you're flossing, it's bleeding, all the bad stuff, the germs, the whatever, the amoebas are going to now leak into your system. And now you have that in your bloodstream. And it's going to distribute it throughout the body. So he said, technically, he was being sarcastic or facetious, but he said, flossing in certain cases could end up leading to a lot of problems. Do you believe in, well, is I, any of that true, by the way? That I, I think that's a strong way of putting it, but let me give you the way I would put it to a patient. So almost everybody who's used floss has experienced this. So if you go between your two back teeth to start, um, and you take the floss out, there's usually some stuff on there. And if you were to sniff that stuff, it wouldn't smell that good. And now what are you doing with it? You're going to the next tooth and the next tooth and the next tooth. So in effect, you're transmitting the bacteria from one tooth to another. Wow. That in itself, that in itself worries me. I often, <laughs> with my colleagues, with my colleagues, I draw the analogy to what happened when we were in microbiology lab. When you grew the bacteria on an agar plate and you took, you wanted to transmit it from one place to the other, you use a little wire, a thin little wire. You'd scrape a little bit up and put it in a different place and grow the bacteria. So I'm not saying that anybody shouldn't floss. Right. But the reality is you've got to understand what it can do and what it can't do. And here's the, here's the real problem. Every research study that's ever been done has shown that less than 5% of the population floss regularly. And of those 5%, 50% of them are probably dentists and hygienists. <laughs> so I don't know who's effective flossing. If a patient of mine is using floss, I don't tell them not to floss. Uh, I mean, look, if you're a wine <laughs> drinker, great. I mean, if you're a wine drinker or you drink a lot of coffee, things that stay... You know, flossing is great for the aesthetic, right? I mean, it makes you look good. As long as you have a clean mouth to begin with and you're not spreading it all over the mouth. And yes, but you have toothpaste that will do the same thing. I mean, toothbrushes and toothpaste are slightly abrasive. And they, if you have some stain on your teeth, that'll take it off. So, I mean, there's a, a lot of ways to get around it. You know, so, I have a periodontist uh, that his wife told me, he said, she said, he is a periodontist and we've had the same floss since we've been married 35 years ago. Like he's not, you know, she was probably exaggerated, but that he doesn't even really floss. Um, but I guess there is a time, but then I talked to other guys, some of your buddies like Dr. McCauley. These are all the key thought leaders in para. For some reason, I love this topic. And he's saying, Randy, there's a film, this biofilm, this microfilm that flossing gets rid of that. What do you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you can get rid of biofilm if you use floss really effectively. The problem is it's very difficult to do. And the biofilm is caused by the bacteria, the same bacteria we've been talking about. So if you can kill the bacteria on a daily basis, you, you win the game. You absolutely win the game. And so, and if you win the game, you're not going to have the inflammatory responses throughout the rest of your body that are mitigated to some extent by these bacteria. Interesting. So that, that I mean, I want to be able to give my patients the simplest thing in the world to do. You know, I often say, um, if you waited for the research to come out that supports everything we do, I mean, if you went back to the 70s, Christian Barnard, if he had waited for it to be published in a textbook, he would never have done the first heart transplant. Look, yeah, and, it, yeah. And, and by the way, by the way, if you develop something, it usually takes a year or two to get it published in a journal and five years before it's in a textbook of any sort. Well, in the meantime, people are dying or, or having periodontal disease or losing their teeth. I'm not against the you know evidence-based treatment i'm absolutely in favor of evidence-based treatment the person who did the most i mean the the laser that we've been talking about for the last while what is very evidence-based there's been all kinds of research that's been done on it papers have been written on it there's support for it but when i started using it 
it was pretty new. And I faced you have to do it. Did you have to do it in the shadows? Like (laughs) you couldn't even when you first started. uh, Here's what I did. I, I had study clubs and people that I could get to listen to what I was saying. I was, you have to understand something. I've been on the board of directors of the American Academy of Perio. I've been an examiner for the people who are taking their boards. And I had to be very careful because I had a presence that was known. So what I did when I wanted to start using the laser is I brought the guy from um, the University of Colorado to town, Ray Yuckner, who had written the first really good paper uh, that supported this. And I had him speak for me to a large group of dentists. And little by little, I started to get referrals because they experienced the same thing with their patients who were having conventional periodontal surgical procedures. Just as an offshoot of that, I also saw that people were getting conventional procedures, conventional surgical procedures when they had gum recession. And I started using the gum, the uh, pinhole, chow pinhole gum regeneration technique. And that is a very different methodology from the traditional. So you have to have some background and some basis and some published papers a little bit before you can start doing these things. But we doctors, and I say this reservedly, we doctors have a a low tolerance for change. We don't embrace new technology. We don't embrace new technologies very easily. It just doesn't It's not in our DNA. So it takes a little risk taking to start in these offshoots. You know, in medicine, there's a lot of talk about gut health, about all the bad bugs in your intestines, in your colon. And, you know, they say like a drug dealer, if the drug dealer, you know, has buyers, you know, he's in this town where everybody's buying his drugs, he stays there. But when all the people that are buying the drugs stop buying the drugs, that drug dealer has to go somewhere else. It's kind of like the bugs in the mouth. I mean, if they have nothing to eat, if, if they have a clean environment or if they're dead, they're going to go away too because there's certain foods, obviously, like sugars and things like that, that I'm sure these things love and they multiply and multiply and grow. Let me tell you what happens to patients who've been through the treatment that you and I are talking about with the laser and with the use of water irrigating devices. When they come in to see my hygienist on a regular basis, they often say, you're going to do a slide today? Because the slide becomes a scorecard and they you mean want swabbing to know their mouth that and bad. looking at it under microscope to see all the, yeah. the, the good, the bad bugs are dead or gone. And they'll see vast reductions in the numbers of bacteria and particular reductions in the pathogens. Do you call them swimmers? What do you call them? Cause they look like they're swimming. Oh, we got swimmers over here. You mentioned, you mentioned the, the, the most important one before the spirochetes. They're the modal forms. Look, it's just like there are good bacteria in the gut and bad bacteria. There's, you take a, a sometimes too much antibiotic and you know what happens because you've knocked out some of the good bugs. Well, there are supposed to be good bugs in the mouth as well. The fact of the matter is that the ones that cause disease are modal forms, spirochetes, modal rods, spinning rods, all of those can be seen to disappear. They have a color. They have a color that the laser picks up and they they kill them. When they grow in, in when they grow in an agroplate in a laboratory, as I said, they're red, yellow, orange, and black. And the laser light energy is attracted to them, kills them on contact without any collateral damage to adjacent tissue. So it's very non-invasive. So when I I can do you know, in the past, you used to do surgery in quadrants. The patient had to have their whole mouth done. It could take a couple of months to do this. Because it hurts, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the downtime on the traditional surgery that's being done every single day, you're slicing Is, open the gums, you're cutting. It hurts, right? Sore. For most people, it, yeah, and, sit, and stitching and cutting. For most people, it's quite uncomfortable. I can't tell you the last time that I used a narcotic pain medication for one of my patients. That's another big benefit. And the patients can walk out of the office, literally, they say, well, how long am I going to be down? I said, you can leave the office and go to work. I can't tell you the number of people 
who I've done a half mouth or a full mouth with the laser, and they've left to go watch the Phillies play <laughs> or the Flyers play. It's it, or gone back to work and given a lecture or whatever. So, so this is like, look, the Whole Foods crowd, the anti-aging medicine, the integrative medicine crowd, these people that don't want to take, they'll, they'll literally death before antibiotics. They don't want to take antibiotics as a last resort. Could you treat this and avoid antibiotics if you're that kind of a person? As a matter of fact, most of the time, we don't use antibiotics. We used to use antibiotics a lot for periodontal therapy. There are a couple of- We, meaning well. you, but across the country, aren't they using antibiotics in They're combination? More, the people who are doing more traditional therapy are probably using more antibiotics. Like seven out of 10 periodontists, seven out of 10 dentists. I don't have the statistics on that. But it's but close to I, that. I mean, everybody accepts that bacteria causes disease. So some people try to at attempt to treat it with antibiotics. The reality is that those bacteria will be back in four to six weeks after the antibiotic. Now, you're a little and more politically correct. Accepted. You're more politically correct than most. I had a woman, uh, Dr. Yetta McCollum, periodontist on my show. She said, Randy, and she's doing it the late, she's using the laser and using your protocols. Yeah, she's and wonderful. She said, I was at a at a meeting watching one of my mentors, the gods of Perio that I used to admire when I was a young student, 28, 20. She goes, and I went, it was on pocket reduction surgery or something like that. She said, and I looked at this, it was like watching ancient history. I could not believe that in today's date that they were still doing this barbaric way to try to cut out a bacterial infection. She said she couldn't even believe it. And it almost made her, and I don't want to put words in her mouth because she sees this or listens to it, but it was like, it was sad for her. Like that here's this mentor that doesn't get it. And I could add another point to that. And that is none of this is being, or most of it is not being taught in any of the dental programs. They don't have either, they don't have the resources to buy the lasers or they don't believe in it. So it's not being taught. So you, most of the time, you have to go outside of the academic environment in order to get it. I think that's changing. It is changing well, and it is changing slowly, but I think we'll get there. See, you know, dentistry is one of the, one of the last things, which I think is, because everybody has to deal with going to the dentist. Nobody likes going to the dentist. And I always say this, that it's, and I tell my friends when I, I said, dentistry is like patchwork, you know? And it's like tartar and calculus, you know, but the bottom line is it's, it's like you lose a tooth, then you lose another tooth and then they patch that up and then you lose another tooth. Then you, then this, you know, it's a combination, I guess, the way the teeth come together could have been, and there's all kinds of factors that make you lose your teeth. But the number one way is this bacterial infection is wiping out your teeth and you're losing one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, four at a time. That to me, it's mind blowing. Like, if the, it's not like dentists, you know, there's conspiracy theorists and I don't believe it. I don't think dentists are going, oh God, if we start using a laser, we're going to put us out of business. I don't believe that. I think that, that, that if, to me, if everybody had the laser, let's say 50 years from now, that you go into your dental checkup and at a low level, the hygienist goes around your mouth and gives you a clean bill of health, makes those gums just beautiful and kills the surface bad bugs or whatever, gives you some of these soft rinses that you won't be losing teeth in the future, possibly, or at once, least to gum disease. Once you've treated the bacteria, and if you continue to focus on the fact that this is a bacterial infection, you'll continue to be healthy. The, the, the fact of the matter is you don't need to have laser being used frequently. And laser is not the only successful way of treating. I don't want to make this sound like this is a, uh, you know, a, a promo for lasers. The laser is a tool. It is simply a tool and it rapidly gets rid of the bacteria. Now, as I said before, that patient's got to do something to stay free of the bacteria. And that's where you were talking about the biofilm and, and, these various methods that we can use for having the bacterial biofilm controlled in the mouth. Uh, so it, it's, it's, I don't think that the laser is the only way to do okay. something, but the reality is we know it kills bacteria. When you go to the dentist, and this is something almost nobody knows. I, I go around asking people this, and I was even in my dentist and the hygienist, 
you're you're laying there or leaning back in the chair and they're saying fours, three, two, four, five. And I and I've learned what that means. It's I guess the 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 amount of pocket that I'm so I'm calling the it like the, the gum kind of pulls away from the thing. That means you gotta you, you're headed for disaster in a way. But I told the hygienist, I go, do your patients know what that means? The pockets? Oh, yes. I explained every one of them. And I go, could I ask these two, you know, they've, you know, and they, they saw me, recognize me from the show. I said, you know, those numbers that they're calling out, do you know what that means? No, not even at all. Not at all. Next one. Not at all. See, and I think, so they're doing a bad sales job. They say, you know, you have periodontal pockets. You're going to have to keep those clean. We're going to do a deep cleaning. They keep trying to scrape. It's like barnacles at the bottom of a boat. The way I put it, it's like they, 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 you know, scrub off the barnacles and then the barnacles grow again. Then they scrub off the barnacles and they grow again. It's like this vicious cycle. Why not just find out what's causing the barnacles and try to kill those barnacles or prevent them from happening in the first place? Is there any truth to what I just said? I think there's truth to what you just said, but the rea what you need to be able to do is not just talk about these pockets, but to let the patient know that these pockets are caused by bacteria and the, and there are ways to get rid of there the bacteria. There we go. And that I bet that discussions does that ever happen in the high with the hygienist? I think hygienists yeah. need to hear this. Yeah. I've never heard yeah. it. They think I'm well, crazy at my dental office, Dr. Hanninger's office. The hygienists there legitimately think I'm crazy to even consider that salt or or bleach or any of that stuff would ever have anything to do with anything. Uh, it we're getting more and more to the pet place where. Hygienists are learning these things. They're going to seminars. They're hearing speakers, myself and others, and they're looking to do something. They recognize that pockets are not just something that happens, but that they're the result of a bacterial infection. And as yeah. long as you accept the fact that periodontal disease and dental disease, the bacteria cause death, tooth decay, so as long as we realize that this is a bacterial manifestation, it's a bacterial disease, then we've got to do something that kills those bacteria. Think about this for a moment. If you had a scrape on your knee and it was getting mildly infected, you know, would you scrub it with a brush or would you run a string across it? I mean, does that make any sense? No, you'd use an antiseptic and a bandage. So applying an antiseptic, it works everywhere. This the whole idea. And this is seems so simplistic. Other, I mean, Steve, it, yeah. it really sounds simplistic. How could a well-educated periodontist that's doing it the cutting it out way, what could they argue with this? How could they argue with it? Give me their argument. Give me their argument. Like what the heck could they say? Their argument is that, the, look, they were taught a certain way by brilliant teachers and they would learn their craft and they are doing what they're doing very, very well. I think across the country, you're gonna get treated well by almost any good periodontist. But how you're treated and what the objective is and what the end point is, is not often discussed. And okay. when other alternatives, when other technologies are offered, we aren't trained to accept new technologies. We just, it, it, it it's a fight. I, I we were, you and I were riding in a cab one time at one of these meetings and you said, you know, also we're tied to surgery. You know, we're surgeons, you know, we're doing gum surgery. It's hard to shift to this newer way because it's so much well, part of your identity as well as a doctor. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. But we're not shifting away from surgery. I mean, theoretically, the laser is doing surgery. It's just doing it microscopically, and it's doing it a different way. It's a different way of getting, and, and its objective is different. The objective is not to cut away the tissue because it does, it's not cutting. It's killing the bacteria, and then the once you're free of the bacteria and can stay free, the body takes over and does what it's supposed to do, and it heals. Look, and look, that's the objective. I getting did the, rid of periodontal disease. I did the research. I mean, there's, uh, you know, we we have San Diego's a big place, San Diego County, and there's less than five guys that are even doing it this way, and so 
it it to me it just blows it, my mind that the surgeries it's it's still a very, yeah. I gotta it's tell you, still but, it's still a very small number now alzheimer's is one of the things i know a lot about my mother had alzheimer's she died because of alzheimer's the complications associated with it bredesen there's a guy named bredesen if you ever read the book it's great it's called the end of Alzheimer's. And he says he's rethinking, reimagining what these amyloid plaques that they find in Alzheimer's patients that he believes, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, that one of the purposes of amyloid pl plaques might be a protective mechanism. And he actually named gum disease and the spirochetes as one of the things that triggers these amyloid plaques to be more prevalent as this protective mechanism. It was very interesting. And of course, because I'm so wrapped up in this, because it, look, in my health talk show, I really, you know, secretly, I, I want people to really know that I get certain inside scoop. And in dentistry, it's like, I feel like, like I don't want to have other dentists on my podcast. I told you this. I mean, I don't want to have a cosmetic dentist. A, that, I don't, I don't want to talk about root canals. I don't even want to talk about dentistry at all. But this is one of those things where it could save people a lot of time, a lot of money, and, and it's easy to do. You could self-treat in many cases if you catch it early, right? The, the, that, is, that is the objective. The objective is to identify the cause, treat the cause, and the body takes over and does its thing. And by the way, those bacteria that you were talking about and the amyloids that are in Alzheimer's disease have frequently been found to be exactly the same bacteria that we're treating in periodontal disease. So there is definitely a relationship between periodontal disease and Alzheimer's disease. Also with- And uh, a whole bunch of other life-threatening diseases. Well, leaky gut, which they call, which is hyperpermeability of the intestine, that they're saying that these, the bugs that the same, the perio bugs are the same that are also that too, because with the bleeding mouth, everything leaks into your system and then it's going to these other areas and infecting them. Let, let me just put it in a much even simpler term. When your gums bleed, that means that the inner lining of the cuff of the gum around the tooth, the little pocket or whatever, is permeated, which means the bacteria are getting into the bloodstream right through the inside of the gum. So if you have bleeding, it's kind of eaten away already. It's kind of like that. I mean, is that, that is correct. That means you already know if you're bleeding, you, it's kind of been eaten away. So you have a very thin barrier and boom. You, 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 you got that so right. The barrier is an epithelial lining, very thin of the inside of the gum cuff. When that is broken, you're into the blood supply, little capillaries. And those bacteria can travel through the body in that way. And that is one of the mechanisms that they believe is associated with, as you've said before, uh, Alzheimer's disease, but a whole bunch of other diseases as well. I mean- You know, people need to know, I'm not trying to be a know-it-all. Everything that I've regurgitated here are things you taught me. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not like, you know, in our past interviews, sure I, but I just I'm, gathered and kind of think, is this really how it really works? And that's why when I say these things, I'm not speaking as an expert, I'm speaking as, based on what you told me, is this really how it is? which I find surprising right. still. But you hang out with a lot of doctors and they're not just dentists, of all kinds of physicians. And you've heard the same things where the, the two fields overlap all the time. And these, the, it's just a simple idea of accepting the fact that inflammatory response in the body is often related, not always, but often related to bacteria. And the most common ones of the, the most common bacteria are the ones we find in the mouth. And it's so easy to treat. In a way, I'm calling it easy to treat. It seems easy to treat. What? And and by the way, I want to do this experiment. I, I was even going to do another secret experiment where I was going to attempt to go back to my salt every day and just not br brush my teeth and see what would happen. Like I was going to do it for a month or a couple of months. I told it to my 18 year old and he just thought I was nuts. But uh, because look, I did that in high school. I, I could go a few days, not, nothing would stick to it because I was a salt fanatic. Probably not healthy for you, the amount of salt I was having, but I don't we've, know. We've talked about tonight some much simpler ways of doing it. So you can do that and you'll, be, you'll, you'll continue, continue to remain healthy. Okay, so the at-home 
uh, protocol. Give us a recap of what things we can do at home to really have a good impact on these invisible bacteria that are growing in the mouth that are bad. I, I think it's very simple. A good, uh, rather than scrubbing with a, with a, with a toothbrush, a good electric like toothbrush. Water, rot water were, pick and an electric toothbrush. And something in that water pick in the, mixed in with the water that's an antimicrobial agent. It doesn't have to be bleach, okay? There are a number of things on the market. Chlorhexidine is one of them that's very common. Um, you've heard of hexachlorophene in, taupe, in, in soap. The chlorhexidine is something you, get, you gotta have a prescription for it, but you use a few drops of that. That is known to kill periodontal pathogens. So, if By you, the way, you never told me about that one that I remember. Why aren't you telling me this? You're, you're holding some things back. I'm keeping a, yeah, I'm holding a few things out on you. The, the reality is that there are a number of things that you can use and you only have to use a little bit of it in the water. So I, I absolutely believe that if you are rigorous with using a good electric toothbrush and a water irrigating device, once a day even with the water irrigating device is sufficient. If you can add to that water something that will kill the bacteria, you're way ahead of the game. Are you okay? Because if you put very fine salt in the water pick, I can't what are your thoughts on that? I can't, I can't recommend salt because I don't know. I, I, I don't know that it kills the bacteria by itself. Um, Kaiser's original technique in which they used uh, salt and uh, baking soda uh, apparently worked. And I told you my story. I wasn't making that up. That was an, a legitimate story. Um, yeah. I, I believe that. It comes back to the same thing, Randy. As long as you recognize that dental disease, for the most part, is the result of a bacterial infection, different bacteria, different problems, the bacteria that cause tooth decay are a little different than the bacteria that cause gum disease, but we're dealing essentially with a bacterial infection. But by the way, cavities mm -hmm. are, that's a type of bacteria? Bacteria, So technically sure. if you did all this stuff, if your kids water picked with this little solutions, these healthy solutions in there, you could prevent a lot of the cavities. Absolutely. So it applies to kids, anybody. Yeah. Yeah, I am I wasting my time with hydrogen peroxide? I, I I forget what your stance is on that because I put that in my water pick all the time. Is that a waste or is it even bad for me? I, I don't think it'll hurt anything. And one percent hydrogen peroxide rinse is being used in offices today to prevent um, you know the possibility of COVID in the mouth. So yes, you can use that. There's nothing wrong with it as long as it's diluted. Well, the, the kind that I buy in the standard bottle, I, I thought it said 3% on there. Cause that's right, what, mixing, is that dangerous? Mixing, Should I not be doing that? No, no. You're mixing it with water. I'm not mixing it with anything. I'm just doing it straight. But didn't you say you put it in your water air gang device? Well, I put that, that is the water. Meaning I take my bottle and I just pour it directly into the water pick. And then I water pick with hydrogen peroxide. Not all the time. I I, I don't think I would recommend that. I think now I you tell me. Yeah, no. Cut it with water. Okay. Cut it with water. So if you go 50 50, you're down to like 1%. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not sure my math is perfect, but the reality that the, the reality is you want to use it much lower and um, hydrogen peroxide as a rinse is okay with water. 1% solution. That's kind of 1.5%. I always feel like some pharmacist yeah. told me, a pharmacist that I knew told me, well, it's an oxygen molecule. It shouldn't be bad for anything. But, you know, she she didn't do any research on it. It was just her it, opinion. How you, I think how you're using it is what's important. How you're using it is what's important. But let's get back to what we were saying before. Tooth decay is a manifestation of bacteria that create acids which cause tooth decay. It's bacterial. Periodontal disease is the reflection of periodontal pathogens, bacteria, that cause periodontal disease. 
get rid of one or both, and you get rid of dental disease, period. Whoa. The two most, common, two most common dental diseases, periodontal disease and dental decay, caries. Now, the the, the, this laser, is it going to, are you using it on, are there settings on it that are lighter that a hygienist could use? Or is that, no, we're well, not there yet. We're not there yet. There are two settings for the laser. One of them is to ablate. Think of that as a microscopic potato peeler that's going in the pocket and taking off the one cell layer or so of diseased tissue. Okay. The second setting is hemostasis, so that even in patients who have who are on blood thinners, Coumadin, for instance, I can use that laser because the second part of the treatment is it coagulates. Like cauterizes then, it in a way? Without cauterizing it, it kill it, it causes it almost like poaching the blood. And it creates a sticky. Uh, substance, and now you can, you have these pockets, you can press the gum against the tooth, and it will adhere to the tooth, so you don't need any stitches. So the beauty of this thing is, it kills the bacteria, it removes the diseased tissue, and then it causes the blood to clot. And when the blood clots, you can then, cl it's closed, and it creates a barrier for bacteria to get in um, from the top down. Okay. Now this podcast so, is not sponsored by the laser company, yeah. but what should they ask their dentist? Like, do you have X, Y, Z laser? What's the name of the laser? Your, this protocol that you're recommending? Well, there are a number of different lasers that do it. So, I mean, the one I happen to be using is an ND YAG laser that is, uh, was created by millennium dental technologies but it, it would be wrong of me to say that that laser is the only laser that does things. However, they are the one laser that is FDA certified. For efficacy, right? Not just being for, safety, for, but for to work. For periodontal disease. The testing has been done. The research has been done. There are any number of research papers that support the use of this. I mean, you can go into the literature today into well-known refereed journals and get that th that this actually works. So I, it's not magic. It's and it, it it kills the bacteria. Kill the bacteria, you win the game. Such a you know, such a simple message, right? We we've talked for an hour and seven minutes so far. It's a simple message, and it's for me as a layperson totally hard to believe that this isn't mainstream. It's like somebody needs a press conference about this because every single day people are getting extractions and root canals and and, and denture wares and all that stuff. And it could, most of that, probably 80, 90% could probably, if you caught them early, early in the game, maybe in twenties, thirties, when it's developing, you could eliminate all these denture wares or tooth loss. Uh, and also, you know, over the past 25 years or so, dental implants have become a very uh, important method of replacing teeth but dental implants are prone to the same periodontal disease that teeth are, only it happens faster. So the bacteria that, that bacteria will, grow, will disease, grow on titanium? It's not that it grows on titanium. It does the same thing. It creates a pocket. It creates separation of the gum from the tooth or from the implant. There's a pocket, and the resistance from the implant is less than the resistance from teeth for a lot of reasons, but that gets into things too technically. The reality is they're using the same lasers to treat peri-implant disease. So- Look, there are now, it's a big business. I mean, I do, you know, dental implants, a big business. So if these people lost their teeth because of a bacterial infection, they're carriers possibly of this. So now you remove the teeth, clean up the gums because the bacteria live on the tooth root in many cases, right? or whatever. So you remove the teeth, you get this implant, you're free from disease forever is almost what's being told to me on a weekly basis with certain guys. Absolutely. But the truth is, but you're Absolutely. telling me that it's popping up now where these implants are getting effect, infected with, with this, but you can treat it the same way based on everything we've talked about so far. Yes. The, the implants are subject 
to periodontal disease. We call it periimplantitis. Is it rare? I mean, have you seen it, a lot of it? More than I'd like to, a lot more than I'd like to. And what I'm saying to you is teeth are more resistant to periodontal infection than implants are because the tooth has a periodontal ligament. It's something between the bone and the tooth and an implant doesn't have that. But the research that's been done, Randy, has shown the same periodontal pathogens, the bacteria that cause periodontal disease cause peri-implant disease. So, and then they got to pull out the implant. Solve the problem by getting implants. So you still have, but but I ne- look, I never hear about this. I never hear about you know. It's like you get your implants, you're done. It's going to live. They're going to stay there as long as you live. No, that 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 may be what we believed 50, 30, 40 years ago that you know an implant was going to last forever. The bottom line is it is not going to last forever. If there's, I mean, you can have periodontal disease around implants and in an environment in which the tooth was lost due to periodontal disease and there are still teeth in the mouth and implants and they have and there's still periodontal disease present the implants are just as prone to getting uh the infection around them and more so than the teeth okay so that is absolutely not true that you're it's the end of the road when you get implants. But if you follow these protocols, can they go to you your website? Do you have, I mean, do you have any of this on your yeah. website or anything like that that they yes. can go to? Yes. www.theperiogroup.com. And there's all kinds of information on there about these <laughs> things we're talking about. Okay. Sounds pretty boring to me, yeah. by the way. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it would be boring to almost anybody who's not a dentist. But what we're, but the, the, when we get done with all of this, if you accept a simple premise, I want to bring this back so that the average person can understand it. Both of the diseases that we have in the mouth, dental decay and periodontal disease, are caused by bacteria. Those bacteria may not be exactly the same that cause tooth decay and gum disease, but we're dealing with a bacterial manifestation that causes disease. If you recognize that, then then it stands to reason that if you treat the bacteria, you're treating the disease and you're going to minimize gum disease and you're going to minimize decay. I think it's a very simple message. Maybe that'd be maybe is, that'd be a good book, "The End of Tooth Decay." Right. <laughs> this is not new news. We knew about we knew that bacteria caused decay a hundred seventy five a hundred years ago. It's not new news. So it's just that we have methods today where we can treat it more effectively, and those methods are not the laser. They are methods of antibacterial, okay. antimicrobial agents. And if we use antibacterial or antimicrobial agents, we can control the oral floor in the mouth so that we don't have these pathogens that cause gum disease and tooth decay. And it's one less thing your immune system has to worry about or deal with. Precisely, because as we said before, these bacteria get through the soft tissue and into the bloodstream. That's where you got that Alzheimer relationship. Inflammatory response in the body is not a good thing anywhere in the body. And those bacteria aren't helping anything by getting in. And they can get in very easily because the barrier between the outside and the inside is easy to broach. Can I ask you this with your patients? Like if you have an infection or uh, uh, whatever in your bladder and wherever, it, it robs you from energy. When you, or like the flu, robs you of energy, you're tired. When you clean up their mouth, you give them, the, you know, do they report a little bit more energy? Absolutely. You have, I wish I had hit on that earlier. There is no question in which somebody's got active infection, particularly in the mouth, they feel a lower source of energy, they don't feel good, they're not energized, 
They don't interact with people as well as much. Um, they're worried about bad breath. Get rid of the bacterial thing and the energy returns frequently. I have patients who will come in after we've done, in, the, in this case, they're talking about the laser a little bit, where we've used the laser to get rid of the bacteria and they are feeling better. They report feeling better. They before, report more energized. They're getting out more. There's no question in my mind about that. Well, good. Well, Dr. Brown, it was it was great to have you on this uh, program. And I know people could go see you in uh, downtown Philly. Is that correct? Yes. We're, we're right in the center of Philadelphia. And what I like right about your office, middle. you guys don't wear masks or any of that stuff. It's just because I'm just joking. I mean, you guys, because of COVID, you guys are like picking it up a notch, right? I, I think the dental profession has been on this from the beginning. We closed our office on March 15th and didn't open again until June 12th. During that period of time, I spent hundreds of hours, and I know my colleagues did as well. I'm really proud of the dental profession. On webinars and seminars on how to protect our patients Good. and how to protect our staffs. And if I look like I have a thermonuclear helmet on when I'm doing <laughs> dental treatment, I feel good about it because we're doing the right thing for the right reasons at the right time. Now, now dentist as a profession, I mean, when AIDS was coming around in the 80s or late 70s or when it was big, you guys knew about aerosols back then. So you've been practicing safely for a long time. I mean, this is not news to you. The dental profession was ready for this. They understand the use of PPE. They understand the spread of uh, aerosols. They understand back, getting back to bacteria again. And the fact is that I think the dental profession has responded to this in a most appropriate way. And if it, it, it's, it's magnificent. And if you go into most dental offices today, you can feel absolutely safe because we have done an enormous amount of work to make it safe for the patients and to make it safe for each other. And it's not like the ER or the hospital because those are sick people. People that normally go to the dentist aren't sick like that usually. That's correct. But we want to make sure they stay safe okay, and good. they stay healthy. I mean, everything that the CDC would want us to do, we're doing. Good. And I, I, I'm not unique in that regard. Are you, you're still accepting new patients or you're just teaching? No, I, teaching is a very part-time thing for me. I do a lot of teaching, but it, it's very part-time. I'm still a full-time practitioner and I love what I do and I love taking care of patients. And uh, I love when people feel good afterwards. As you mentioned before, literally they change. Literally they don't have bad breath anymore. Literally, they don't have periodontal disease. Their energy level, as you mentioned, in, is enhanced. They're nice. happier people. You know, we haven't even talked about the one last thing that you, that oftentimes your general dentists, when their teeth are really bad, that teeth you used to extract 10 years ago, you don't have to extract today. You told me that. Yes. We don't have to extract teeth because we're controlling the biggest cause of lost teeth, periodontal disease. All right. The single biggest cause of lost teeth in the world is periodontal disease. So if we can control periodontal disease and if we recognize it's an infection, we can control it. There we go. All right. Dr. Brown, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, pleasure to have you on. Good stuff. Thanks. It's been, it's been lots of fun. Thanks. All right. You've been watching the Randy Alvarez podcast. I'm Randy Alvarez. We'll see you next week.